DOR receives a collection, a set of session tools that it can use for authentication and encryption. And many carriers, especially if you're a roaming subscriber, will reuse those keys several times in order to reduce traffic to DHLR. So it depends on the network operator. We know, for example, that Deutsche Telekom um, um, in Germany never reuse keys. They generate fresh keys every time they use a key, it's a new key. We also know that AT&T in North America will use the same key for days at a time. And it's probably to reduce traffic on their HLR. Okay. So, There's a complete cabbage question. I have a Nokia 6070 or something like that. It has a little lock symbol on it. It comes on when the phone registers for like two seconds and then it's never seen again. And it says in the manual that this means that the encryption, that the connection is encrypted. Hmm. I'm What's surprised it shows it. <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm really, really, the, the, the operator, the operator who issued your SIM card can control whether or not that icon means anything. Okay. And usually it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Wait, so how does the icon get transferred? I mean, it's controlled by some other... Uh, There's a bit in the SIM card. There's a bit in the SIM card that tells whether or not to show that icon. Mm -hmm. So, we can keep drawing on. Um, we can do text messaging hands on. Alexander, what's your preference? Yeah, I think you have SMS messaging and. Um, that's the last thing in substance I think we have. Oh, what's the audience thing? What's that? What's the audience, audience thing? What's the question? I'm sorry. Should we <laughs> have a few more minutes on text messaging or do we move on to just live stuff? Alexander, you're up. So, hey, but this is the part which will be in the presentation. We can download later. You said you're going to do something. Yeah, in the end. yeah, yeah, it'll be in the presentation. So, so we can, okay, yeah. <laughs> you're promising stuff that I. Don't know of, that I should. Oh, deliver on. Uh, we should not put the PDFs on the. Oh, okay. Your presentation. Very good. Yeah. Very solid. So Alexander's gonna um, hook up his computer because I didn't bring a little computer. Where do you go? Oh, okay. Oh, great. Well, you'll get to hear about shortcodes anyway because you didn't have the stuff. I'm sorry. I can't. Um, real quick. Text messaging, GSM, uh, SMS, text messaging, it's, it's, um, it's text messages are transferred over, D channel, over DM channels. Um, you know, it's a maximum 140 bytes because of a bottleneck somewhere in the SS7 network. Um, the SMSC is access, access store and forward server. It's kind of like an email server. Um, we do SMS over SIP using something called RC3428, simple page mode messaging. Um, there's just a, a SIP method called message, and you encode the um, you encode the content of the SMS into that. So OpenBTS normally uses a MIME encoded RPDU. RPDU is the sort of layer five, um, the layer yeah the layer five representation of the text message it's in the short message service center, and we just that's just encoded in. Um, According to this um, MIME type, it's just a hex string that encodes the RPDM. So in OpenBTS, layers 3 and 4 terminated locally. Layer 5 goes out over, over the SIM message. Um, outgoing stuff is addressed numerically. So, so text messaging that's coming out of OpenBTS is going is addressed numerically to ISDN addresses. Text messages coming into OpenBTS are addressed to MZs. Because OpenBTS really doesn't know anything about phone numbers. All that information is external. Um, note, you cannot send directly from one handset to another. You have to change the format of the RPDU. You have to change the addressing type. Um, we use storm forward. So we have something called SMQ. 
Uh, the storm forward server, the design of SMQ was originally based on an email server because the person who wrote it SMQ didn't know anything about SIPs, so they thought it was being like an email server. Um, the person was actually John Gilmore. So, um, very colorful comments in the SMQ source book. Um, but because, because we use the RPD encoding comment, we're sort of alphabet agnostic because the alphabet type is actually encoded as part of that RPD. Um, and it's about that on text messaging. So this is what mobile originated uh, text message transfer looks like. A whole bunch of channel setup and handshake and acknowledgement over on the ISDN side and just this simple bang, bang on the system. So when Alexander and I were discussing this, we said, well, you know, we can set up some base stations and we give everybody just to log into some base stations and um, have access to them directly and um, say, yeah, that'll work if like, you know, four or five people show up. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do instead, Alexander gets back in here. And um, how do you connect SMS to, uh, I've seen a slide, SMS connect to real world. Yeah, connecting SMS to the real world on OpenBDS is complicated because you um, you can't you can't normally bind a voice over IP carrier who also supports text messaging. You can find text messaging services that will support text messaging over SIP but don't do phone calls, and you can find voice over IP services who support phone calls over SIP but don't do text messaging. The reason you don't find anything that does both is because you need to be you need to have contracts with members of the GSMA in order to get both services in order to get the SMS service and the GSMA really really doesn't want voice over IP carriers in the text messaging business. So if you you know if you're if you're a voice over IP carrier and you start getting uh, contracts for for SMS access and you start selling that as a wholesale service they'll blackball you you won't be able to get. The, the, the GSMA will block all you, mm -hmm. and you won't be able to get the service anymore. What about uh, audio codecs? What happens to the GSM audio codec? Is it directly just transferred to a RTP? Yeah, at OpenBTS, the audio codec is trans... We, we just send the raw GSM codec out of OpenBTS, and if you want transcoding, you do it somewhere else, doing the switch. Um, GSM 4A codec is supported by plenty of... Um, so Software, you know, plenty of web software supports JSON for it, and supports transcoding and that code. Is that also true for AMR? Um, yeah, there's, there's AMR is more widely, is becoming pretty widely supported, and it's also supported in voice over IP. So, um, David? Yeah. Would you send the uh, different demo uh, kits around so people can see them? Sure, yeah, thank you. So we've got a couple examples of some hardware that was um, built to run open BTS. Um, this piece, has anybody ever seen a USRP or worked with a USRP, Edis USRP? So if you're familiar with the USRP, um, this radio I'm holding here, and this radio installed here are very similar designs. The difference is that you're looking at two different sides. This one's bolted down, you can't turn it over, and this one's got a cover on it that's really hard to remove. So you see both of them and you can flip it over and look. Um, this part, if you're familiar with the USRP, you'll say, wow, that looks a lot like one half of the USRP motherboard. And it is. Um, except that it's had uh, some uh, temperature sensors and uh, voltage trimmable uh, VCT, VCTCXO added to it. Um, so we can actually control the clock frequencies, which is a big deal when you're running your MTS. Uh, this side is the analog side, um, you know, the, the actual RF part for the radio. is normally under a cover to protect the receive side from interference from RF. Um, this is just a consumer mini ITX board. This is a death kit. It's not meant to be. It's not meant for actual field service. It's just meant to be put in a lab on desktop or something. That's why we're just using consumer grade mini ITX board for death kit. Um, is that a kit that someone sells that we get our hands on? This kit? Yeah, but I'll be very frank. This kit is not priced for hobbyists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This means 
This means the retail price is yen about five thousand dollars. So if you want to do open BTS, even though even though this is my product, this is not the, if you're a hobbyist, it's not the product I would recommend. Yeah. Is there a cheaper alternative for uh, for the USRP? Um, the USRP is about the most expensive thing you can get. Um, Two thousand dollars. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> The fairway view of the RX is supposed to come out soon. I don't know what that's about. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are, if you're like a university or nonprofit or something, there are discount programs. But again, it's not really priced for hobbies. It's, it's intended it's, it's priced for commercial industrial But could this be changed inside of ETS? I think it is not a problem for the public audience. Which? Code negotiation. So you have to look at the You are always using the same yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, which is GSM4? So, if you want to take a look at the you should ask them around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now some more stuff about the hardware which you could use to run on BTS. Um, I'll also say a few words about the software which we use. And then, before we show the real live system, I'll give word to David for a few more words about <coughs> licensing. From the live system. <laughs> well, because I believe that's important to understand that usage of spectrum um, is licensed that it may disrupt uh, normal operations and this is very important things to understand. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone really understands this and hears this before we go to real demonstrations. Um, so, the OpenBTS system from hardware perspective looks about like that. So uh, you have a GSM antenna, you have uh, this RF gear which amplifies and the filters, all the stuff which David was talking at the very first part. Then you have transceiver uh, which, uh, which converts uh, analog signals to digital domain. Uh, and this is, uh, in OpenBTS case, is a software defined radio. So this, in few words, it's basically a, a ADC and DAC connected to an antenna in a very simplified way. Well, definitely more more uh, complicated. And you have a CPU unit which actually runs all the software uh, for all the uh, higher level processing, all those uh, package shuffling. And you have back hole which connects the CPU unit uh, to your main network. Well, uh, you may run this in a um, in a so-called network in the box mode, where everything uh, on a single CPU. Um, in this case, you may have or may not have a back hole. It will be just a, a self-contained uh, GSM GSM network on a single uh, on, on a single uh, tower. So, uh, if we uh, list this this hardware, uh, you. Uh, have the, this radio frequency hardware, you have CPU unit and you have transceiver which connects your CPU unit, the digital domain to radio domain. And uh, all this stuff is usually available in the market. And you may not, you, you may be able or may not be able to buy this like on eBay, but it is available and if, if you're a company you could source this pretty easily from various uh, manufacturers all over the world, from China to the US. And uh, because it's just general GSM power amplifiers, general GSM antennas, they are manufactured in huge quantities. A CPU unit is a general um, processor. And but transceiver is somewhat special because this is something you can't usually find in mass production. And uh, vendors, big vendors like Akata Lucent, Huawei, like ZTE, they do not sell you, they won't sell you transceiver they use for their base stations. And even if they sell, uh, well, it's very special hardware, which is 
pretty complicated and hard to, to, to insert into your system. So for a long time this was that is a problem. Um, so this was a problem, but um, I think with the software defined treaty approach it it became much much easier. And the first hardware which was used for OpenBTS was uh, Edit Research Users, um, and still many people use this hardware. But it has some limitations, and I'll talk about this slightly later. So uh, it basically has, right now you have about three options. You could create a uh, do-it-yourself, uh, like keep, buy everything by yourself, assembly, assemble it on your bench top and try to run this. Well, in some cases it runs, in most cases it doesn't run for the first try. I should say that uh, when I tried running on BTS for the first time, it took me about two months to get the first call. Um, it was a very long, very long try. Um, Only the hardware perspective was yeah, the hard, it's a hardware perspective. Okay. Software was easy. <laughs> um, so uh, you could try to assemble this. Nowadays it's much easier. Um, it, it, it was more complicated theory. Uh, and well, range groups and bitfavors provide hardware uh, which is specifically designed to run OpenBTS and is self-contained. So uh, first, uh, what do you need to have an uh, OpenBTS running for your lab? Because I believe that most people here want to experiment and just have an access to, to, like, to a JSON on, on your table to play with it. Uh, so for hardware, uh, starting from CPU unit, usually you um, <coughs> just use any x86 computer we usually use our laptops uh, in uh, production boxes. It's usually some uh, industrial uh, atoms or core to do or for a three, i five, i seven, you know, all these kinds. Uh, some people try to run on BTS on ARM, and some of them even succeed. But this is really low performance, and you should clearly understand that when you want to run. Open BTS on say Raspberry Pi, which is a very very popular question. When people start asking about Open BTS, they very very quickly get could I run this on Raspberry Pi? It's so neat, it's so cool, it's so cheap, but the answer is usually no. Well, you could, but it would be very very limited usage. So, because it's very very uh, low profile. Yes. What is an ARFCN? Uh, so ARFCN, uh, as David mentioned, is uh, absolute radio frequency channel number, and basically this abbreviation is used to um, to refer to a single frequency channel. And single frequency channel um, contains eight times slots, so you could run seven of oh, one and one is always. Uh, occupied by like by uh, control stuff, and seven time slots are available for for calls. So to run like a single channel base station, uh, you need at least uh, like x86 because uh, ARMs at their current state uh, cannot run full BTS. So you could you might be lucky enough to get several calls running on this on, on, on ARM but you should be very yeah. skilled to do this 500 megahertz RMA8 can run two time slots no, standard GSM ARM has eight slots so you can run two of them on 500 megahertz A8 like um, gum sticks yeah, so there are new ARMs like A15 which are much more powerful than what they used to be but they are just coming and uh, we yet have to see how well they perform. Uh, maybe, maybe hopefully. Uh, I know that you tried to run PowerPC. Yeah, we run, we, we have run, we have, uh, well, we had very good results with a one year PowerPC. Mm -hmm. We run a full, full, full eight slot system. Yeah, so I don't know, like, was there a recent OpenPTS works on PowerPC? I haven't tried it. 
Okay, yeah, but it's, it may be possible, but some people love them, they love Power PC. I know that there are people who are really, really like lovers of Power PC. You could try to do it. So will yes. scale will more calls give them more channels? So uh, just processing power, or can I? Can I so uh, okay, uh, here the thing: uh, your number of calls is limited by two factors. First is your radio here, uh, which uh, limits your number of uh, RF cans from the radio perspective, and your processing power which limit num the number of available like, uh, RF cans and time slots from the processing perspective. And, uh, well, so this is two pieces and they should fit together. And this is just a digital part. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you start above five RF cans, you start running into a bandwidth problem on the US, at least for the red um, one stuff, you run into a bandwidth problem on the USB interface. Yeah, so, uh, well, I don't, so this is talk about, this part is about do it yourself, so mm -hmm. I can't put it in range here because I, mean, I don't think you sell and do it yourself case later. So if, if you want to assemble yourself, uh, you usually buy Atlas research equipment, uh, which is available for like, many years, many people use it, all it works mostly. Uh, I recommend you to read uh, carefully the wiki about using this because uh, as Dad also mentioned uh, it's very important for a GSM uh, to have a very very stable uh, reference clock and if you do not have a stable reference clock you will see the whole number of weird behavior starting from phones just not seeing the network to phones behaving weirdly during a call dropping randomly all kinds of stuff, and uh, so uh, some parts, some uh, versions of users are better, some are worse. Please read the wiki very carefully before you, before you buy something. Mm -hmm. well, uh, and so we have developed our own version of uh, uh, software defined radio, which is based on user uh, and which is uh, designed specifically for open BTS, so it has uh, much less uh, problems. For example, we use GPS, GPS to synchronize to, uh, to GPS signal for um, reference clocks to stabilization. Just one example. Um, and for benchtop, uh, you could use basically any antenna, any GSM antenna you could buy on a uh, local store. Or and uh, in most cases, you don't really even need an antenna uh, because, uh, again, all those transceivers transmit enough, transmit enough power uh, to cover like, a room like this without any antenna. Uh, so it's just up to you. And for a hot and for a bench top use, you do not need booster. <laughs> that's that's the important part. Uh, so some people try to, to assemble systems for like real use uh, on their part. Uh, I want to tell you how to do this because it's really in most cases a bad idea because. Uh, if you don't have a like, use of experience of radio, you most likely will pollute the network and disrupt some other operation trying to run this. So, again, if you have all those years, you know how to use it without me. If you don't have those years, then just, just don't try to do that. Is there, sorry. Yes. Is there some, some kind of uh, test frequency band where no. We can actually talk about this. Yeah. So we've got some web pages on that. Yeah. But the short answer. Um, so yeah, this is 
so if you want to run something more serious than a small GSM network on your table, then I strongly recommend you to buy something which was assembled previously by people who understand how to run uh, high power systems because again, the version is not that easy and you may not notice how it is run. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. So this is a um, line of range equipment. Do you want to say something about this? So yeah, this is equipment from range networks. These are ready-built units for running open BTS in different conditions. The development kits which are passing around right now. And that's really intended for lab use. If you want to get the series, um, this is a set of units with um, Certain, they run up in, in size capacity up to 50 watt, 50 watt 5 RP units. Um, they're built, you know, every, everything other than the development kits built and survive very wide temperature ranges and a fair amount of environmental abuse. So the 5150 series is intended for, you know, it's a rack mounted system for field service. The SNAP network is a, is a base station, it's a 1 watt base station in an outdoor enclosure that's intended to be mounted on a utility pole just on the antenna. Yeah, so this is basically taken from, from your website, again, for, for people to understand. Um, we are still developing our hardware, which is very, which we are bought, um, assembled, this is picture, and yeah, it has a pretty similar um, architecture, uh, it's slightly less output of power, up to 10 watts, uh, but uh, by default we will ship it, I forgot to mention here, uh, by default uh, we ship with two physical channels, uh, so you could uh, have two antennas and two amplifiers um, and run two single, uh, single RCN, single channel uh, BTSs on, on, this, uh, on, the, on a single unit. So, um, software uh, is a, the recent version is 2.8, and uh, you should really use this version. Uh, earlier versions are not supported because development is pretty quick, and uh, version 2.6, which was the previous version, was released like more than a year. Oh, uh, yeah, so 2.6 is you know, a few years old. Yeah. Two years old, yeah. Um, it is really, really outdated. Don't want to try to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, these are some some links for you. Uh, they are official. Uh, some version is here. You can just check out and see. Uh, we maintain a GitHub uh, for which, which basically follows. Uh, the subversion, yeah, maybe if you prefer GitHub, Git, you may just copy the master from our branch. It's almost always in sync and it has some other uh, private branches. And uh, for other features like uh, which are developed by community, uh, they are listed on the wiki at the very end and uh, yeah, so we could probably just open the website.
this is the instructions to how to build this. And I don't think we have the capacity right now to go through those instructions, but just to go, just to mention this very quickly, uh, basically, you need to get the OpenBTS, uh, OpenBTS uh, software, and if you're using uh, Ethos hardware or our hardware, you also have to install uh, so-called UHD, which is, is which is a driver for this an abstraction layer for Ethos research, um, for Ethos research hardware. Again, this is pretty boring long process. But it's pretty well documented, and if you follow exact steps, you will get an um, up and running OpenBTS system. But you must sure that you really follow every step because there are some peculiarities like Asterix and Tau, for example, um, which are not obvious. And you might think that that's not important, and then you get a system which doesn't work. Yeah, so the two. The two most difficult parts of installing OpenBTS are if you're using Edis hardware, you have to install the parts of GNU Radio, which can be a bit of a bear because um, it's sort of a kitchen sink open source project. And then, um, yeah. oh, we should include that. Okay, another dependency. Um, and then you also have to uh, build and configure Asterisk to run in real time mode with an external database. And that's not its default configuration. Well, no, uh, provisioning process. I think it wasn't completely documented on the website, it links to some other place. I remember for me when I configured it, that was the thing that took me the most to find it. And it was already it fine. Actually, you just need to actually edit the, the MySQL that I have done, SQLite like the database. Mm -hmm. It's like not, not some wizard. You're right, yeah. Yeah, right now it is manual that they're doing this. Yeah, just so everybody Yeah, you provision subscribers by putting stuff in SQLite 3 database. They're actually, um, you can actually get a database browser from Firefox. There's an SQLite 3 database browser built into Firefox that you can use, but you'll need something for editing SQLite 3 databases. So the software structure. Uh, this is a picture which shows the main parts of OpenBTS architecture. Uh, as, again, as David mentioned, OpenBTS is split into several parts, and to extend it, you just you could just add more parts. So the OpenBTS itself is um, the part which um, actually talks to the hardware and translates the GSM into SIP messages. And the rest of the system works over SIP, as you could see. Um, so the PBX is a software, is, is a SIP soft switch. And again, uh, the default installation described on the wiki is using Asterisk as PBX. And also, you could try to use a free switch or gate as a as a, as, a, as a PBX, well, we personally use a free switch here. Um, well, just because we know it better, I don't know if David is uh, moving towards gate, and I don't know, like, you may try to use other PBX. It should be pretty straightforward because uh, SIP and wise which are exchanged with a PBX is, well, just SIP and wise This should work with almost any salt switch. Yeah. Then uh, we have SMQ, which is uh, a software which handles um, the short messages and is intended to be a um, so software uh, SMS center. It's not yet very full, very well future, and probably it will be rolled roll quite soon. But right now, that's what what is used. So when a uh, phone sends a message, a uh, sort of message is converted to SIP message and sent to SMQ and then SMQ tries to uh, to page mobiles uh, and send SIP messages back to PBX. 
And it's called Q because it tries to store messages, uh, not just like in instant messaging when you uh, try to send a message and if uh, your, your other side isn't available, it won't be delivered. Uh, SMQ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It said that Windows is version of Windows. So, uh, as you know, uh, short messages is not like instant messaging. Uh, so, if the other subscriber is not available, your short message uh, will be uh, delivered to it to the subscriber when it becomes available and uh, SMQ tries to do that. Right now it doesn't really uh, store uh, short messages for a long time uh, and don't wait for other subscriber uh, to, to appear on the network, but uh, it at least uh, tries to um, make a reasonable amount of effort to deliver your message. Uh, if their subscriber is somewhere in the net. Uh, because it, as you know, like the radio uh, may be unreliable, so the first try might not be successful, and you will try several times to deliver the message. And so the CPAL serve uh, is uh, the part of the software uh, which is responsible for authentication. Uh, and they've mentioned this several times. Um, and when Phone appears on the network, it sends, it sends location update, which is transferred to SIP register, and the SIP register is sent to CPAL surf, which maintains this um, subscriber registry here. So uh, we have a number of databases, and setting up databases is again one of the convoluted parts of, of setting up OpenBTS because all of them must be in the right places with right permissions. So when you set up on BTS, make sure uh, you have all those data databases uh, correctly placed and you have permissions to have to write to directories which con contains those databases because uh, we use SQLI and SQLI uh, creates another files near the actual database file when access uh, the database. So you must have the right permissions to the directory which contains those databases. That's an important part and many people miss this. Um, so these uh, databases are just configuration databases and um, they are well, contain uh, simply speaking pairs of string and value, and strings are keys for configuration, and values are the values for configuration. And uh, each part has its own uh, database for, for configuration. So, and, uh, and this database is the most important part because it contains uh, a list of subscribers, and uh, you have to provision it with your subscribers unless you run so-called uh, open registration.